Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Ask Me Anything About Censorship with Kristen Peekle. We are delighted to have you here, and thank you for joining this important conversation. I hope you brought some questions. My name is Ellie Diaz, and I'm the Program Officer at the Office for Intellectual Freedom. Before we delve into the conversation, I just wanted to wish everyone a very happy Band Books Week. It's a time to raise awareness about the freedom to read and really spotlight recent censorship attempts. If you're unsure how to celebrate or you just want to learn more about Band Books, this webinar is the perfect place to ask questions and get answers. Today, we're joined by Kristen Peekle, the Assistant Director of the Office for Intellectual Freedom. Kristen will talk about a couple things tonight. First, how Band Books Week got started, and then what we're seeing now in the censorship landscape, and also how you can stand up for the freedom to read. The majority of the time will be, sent, will be spent on questions. We really want to hear from you and what you've always wanted to know about censorship. If you have a question already, please post it in the Q&A box, or you can comment throughout the presentation. Kristen will be there to answer questions toward the second half of the program. This presentation is also streamed live on the Band Books Week Facebook page. Hello, Facebook. Those who are catching the live stream on the Facebook page can post their questions in the comments. So first, just a little bit of background info about our office. Kristen and I are two team members of the American Library Association's Office for Intellectual Freedom, or as we like to call it, OIF. Founded in 1967, the office provides confidential support when there's a censorship issue in libraries, schools, or universities. Anyone can contact us about censorship happening in their community. We also use a database to track all of these incidents, and this allows us to identify censorship trends and also publish reports and infographics on the most censored titles, such as the top 11 most challenged book list. And we also offer an array of resources, both online and in person including toolkits, workshops, and programs. And a little bit about our speaker today, Kristen. Kristen Peekle is the Assistant Director of the Office for Intellectual Freedom. She's the first person librarians or educators talk to when they're facing censorship. She is also an avid puzzler and West Wing watcher, and has also built houses for Habitat for Humanity. So Kristen, let's jump right in. Fantastic. Thanks, Ellie. Um, and happy, again, happy Band Books Week to everybody. This is um, one of my favorite times of year. I think it's up there with um, Halloween and my birthday. Um, I've been celebrating Band Books Week uh, probably since I was in library school about 20 years ago. Um, and just have always really enjoyed that expression of the freedom to read and talking about which books have really made an impact on me. Um, so for me, it's been 20 years, but for Banned Books Week, it's been since 1982. So there is quite a history with Banned Books Week, and it has to really start with, um, you know, the first time it ever happened was during an American Bookseller Association's conference. It was 1982, and the conference attendees walked into the building, and there were all of these cages, and books were locked in them, um, and it started to really initiate the conversation about the freedom to read and what it meant to take away that expression. Um, in both libraries and in in bookstores. So it was that time that ABA president um, connected with Judith Krug, who is the founder of the Office for Intellectual Freedom and the um, Freedom to Read Foundation. And they connected to make it an annual event. And so we have Banned Books Week. Um, so that first picture that you see on the left, that is pictures from the 1982 ABA um, conference. And then you'll see that as people have been celebrating Banned Books Week for years, there have been um, protests and court cases. You'll see on the right-hand side that is a picture from the PICO case 
This was the Island Tree School District v. Pico. This was around the same time as 1982, and I think this is one of the reasons that we had such a, a great interest in Ban Books Week and talking about it. Um, Pico was the one of the pivotal cases where books were challenged in a school library. They were removed by the school board and students, Stephen Pico um, and his family, sued the school district to remove the books. And the, and the courts really found that it was unconstitutional to remove the books um, from the school library. And so you see there, it's the, uh, the first, one of the first cases um, where we were to really use the school libraries. And then the picture in the middle is um, a librarian who, was raising awareness during Banned Books Week by getting arrested. It was a public arrest, it was a mock arrest in her library um, to raise awareness. So they did the arrest on Monday and then there, um, they had the teen zone put together a protest signs and they had um, a jury and they had a defense counsel and they did a mock trial and even the preschoolers had a lesson on self censorship, I'm sorry, on regular censorship and hosted a library sit in to free the books. So you can see that there's a lot of activism that really comes with uh, Banned Books Week. One other thing I wanna mention um, is about the diverse materials that we see targeted by censorship. We noticed a few years ago, and, and I think um, many other times, that the top 10 list and the list of books that we compile that have been banned and challenged really highlight um, the, the underserved, underserved communities, uh, populations in our community. And that could be LGBTQ, it could be um, all sorts of communities that are represented in books with identities, about issues, characters, and we see that represented in the top 10 books. This year, you'll see an overwhelming number of books from George to A Day in the Life of Marlon Bundo. Um, this one summer, drama, a lot of them have LGBT characters um, and deal with issues uh, about sexuality and gender identity. Diverse materials are often represented as well, or diverse ideas are often represented not just in materials, but in programs as well and in displays. So we're seeing um, challenges and censorship of drag queen story hours, Black Lives Matter displays, and even in some of the, the censorship that we see that isn't just um, removing or requesting a removal of a material or a canceling of a program, but in hate crimes like vandalizing books and materials. Um, this picture down here is um, vandalism of a religious viewpoint. And so we're seeing that across the board, that diverse materials are being targeted by censorship. Um, the idea of wanting to get rid of the things that their people are not comfortable with. At, in, at the American Library Association, uh, one of our strategic directions, one of our core focuses is on equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, we say that libraries can and should play a crucial role in empowering diverse populations for full participation in the democratic society. And that within the libraries and the services and operations of the libraries, we have efforts to include diversity in our programs, our activities, our services, our professional literature, products, and in continuing education. We really encourage this and we want it to be ongoing. Um, so because of that support, we um, make a point of supporting libraries who are providing materials during challenges that some might consider um, offensive or um, that they might not agree with. So fact, anyone can stand up to censorship. But one of the things about that is that you need to know censorship when you see it. 
And in order to do that, we need to be aware of censorship. So there are a couple of different ways that you can be aware of censorship. Censorship is any type of restriction of access to materials or services, resources uh, made by a governing authority. And that could be vandalizing, that could be um, hiding the resources, that could be burning books, it could be removing materials, it could be requiring permission slips or um, restricting access based on labels or ratings. So when you see censorship in any of its forms, um, we, we ask that you report it, that you be aware of it, that you tell others about it, and that you shine the light on it. Whether that's um, social media, it could be um, reporting it to the American Library Association, it could be writing about it in a letter to the editor or blogging about it, it could be um, bringing it up at uh, public board meetings and just making sure that, uh, you, that you're aware, the community is aware and, and highlighting these injustices when we see them. Anyone can stand up to censorship. This could be um, a child, a teenager, a student, a college student. It can be an adult, a board member, a teacher. I have a couple of examples here of people standing up for censorship. Uh, the picture on the right is a challenge that happened in the West Chicago Public Library. Um, to this day in June by Gail Pittman. And there was an, an intense number of people that showed up to the library to protest the removing of this book from the library. You'll see a, um, a, a march with protest signs. That's from the West Bend Library Challenge in West Bend, Wisconsin. There was a challenge to the uh, graphic novel Persepolis Mar Jane, by Marjane Sartropi, and that happened um, at the Lane Tech Academy here in Chicago. And students stood out in the rain during the protest and just um, demanded that people hear that they have the First Amendment rights to read these materials and the freedom to read. And they stood up against censorship. Um, there is a really great video here that we're going to show you. This is put together by Bookman's. And I'll let you guys see this for a second. So it seems like we're having some problems with audio. I'm not sure if a YouTube video is going to uh, broadcast on Zoom. So just we will make sure and share the link in the chat box and on social media. This is a really great video about um, shining the light on censorship and expressing. Um, and there's some really great quotes from different banned books. And it's all different ages, all different genders. Um, it's really a great example of standing up for uh, the right to read and against censorship and, and raising awareness of the harms of censorship. This was put together by a bookstore, um, Bookman's, and it just, again, it could, it could be a nice production like this um, that really goes into creating this amazing video. 
It can be a picket. It can be writing a letter. It can be making a comment at a board meeting. Um, it can be, you know, doing a standout video or writing a letter to your favorite band author. There are lots of ways that you can stand up um, to censorship and, and make your your values and your rights known to others. So we kind of did some of the basics and the history, and we'd love to hear from you. If anyone has any questions, you can post them in the Q&A box. And if you have questions from Facebook, please share them in comments. We'd be happy to grab, grab them that way as well. I think one of the most common questions that we've heard on social media this week is actually about that infographic that you showed about the top 11 most challenged books, which kind of breaks down um, why they were challenged and how they were actually censored. You talked about kind of like those five ways of censorship. Um, so the infographic includes the word banned, challenged, and burned. And some people actually thought that burn was a typo. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about why that infographic includes the word burn. That's a great question. So we look at um, the different types of challenges. A challenge could be any request to remove access to materials or services. Um, so when we're tracking things that are challenged, it could be a def filling out of the formal reconsideration form. A ban is when things are removed. So that form is filed and um, the book is removed from the local library or taken out of the curriculum, that is a ban. In certain situations, uh, people who are offended by materials, um, who don't agree with them, to, that find them repulsive and all sorts of other words, will go so far as to burn books, burn materials. Um, this happened in 2018. There was a situation in Orange City, Iowa, where a patron went into the library and checked out four LGBTQ children's books and went into a, a field with an oil drum and lit the books on fire during Facebook Live. And so it was a, a public book burning. Um, and so the, it still happens. That is a form of censorship. Um, we do report that. We do record that. So whether um, things are, you know, like pages are removed from a book or maybe um, a, black high, a black marker is used to high, um, cross out certain words. Um, those are all forms of censorship that we track. Anytime access is restricted, we want to know about it and we want to track it. Um, and so that's what that infographic represents are the multiple ways that people can censor materials. I think um, another question that's um, often floating around during Band Books Week is what is your favorite band book? And maybe while you're answering that, Kristen, um, the attendees, everyone could also post their favorite band book in the chat box. Uh, picking my favorite band book is like picking my favorite child. Um, and I have quite a few of them. Um, so I'm gonna list a couple just because I can. Um, to Kill a Mockingbird is one of my favorites. And uh, the, the, that quote that says, I never knew I could love reading, like I never knew I could love breathing until someone took it away. I forget the whole quote, but that one's always really powerful. I think it helped that it was also a Band Books Week poster. That was one of my favorites. Um, I really love the works of Chris Crutcher. Uh, Chris Crutcher is one of my favorite authors of all time, uh, and he wrote a book that has been um, banned and challenged many, many times in high schools, um, and high schools that I know of. We'll stick with that. Um, and that book is Whale Talk, and it's a, it's a book that every single time I read it, and I've read it many, many times, it has made me laugh, and it has made me cry. Um, it is such a, a complex story with some really strong themes of um, racism and equality, uh, parenting, bullies, 
violence. Um, and I think it's often challenged mostly because of the language used in it, because it's a story where the characters are high school boys. And um, I think they tend to use profanity every once in a while, maybe, sort of. So um, that's one of the reasons that it is often banned and challenged. Um, but it doesn't ever stop um, being one of my favorites, and I love it. Chris Crutcher is also a, a huge supporter of the Freedom to Read and will often um, talk about banned books and what it's like to be challenged. So he's one of my favorites. Let's see, who are some of my other favorite ones? Harry Potter, that's a big one. Um, we also have a question um, from an audience member. Kristen, what, what would you say the problem starts in considering books and print culture as something that rules our lives rather than guide it? I think people are menaced by books considering they will, they will be forced into something they are prejudiced for. I'm going to have to have you repeat that one again. Um, so let's start with the first half of it. What would you say the problem, where the problem starts in considering books and print culture as something that rules our lives rather than guides it? Well, I think, um, you know, words have such an amazing power to change how we think about something. Um, and and I think people will often, as great a power as it is, they might give it too much power sometimes. And so instead of taking a book and thinking about how it affects you and how it might guide you and, and giving it a more um, critical, thoughtful process with it, um, people might take words and books um, as like a black and white be all that and that ends all kind of idea without really kind of giving it uh, the critical thinking that it deserves. Thanks Alejandra for that question. Um, Alora asks how many bans or challenges do you think go unreported? Way too many. Um, we've done some studies where we've compared the reports that ALA gets with other um, organizations or groups that have tracked cha changes, challenges in a state. So, for instance, um, the Texas American Civil Liberties Un Union, the Texas ACLU, had done um, some FOIA requests of school libraries and would track challenges that way. Um, the Oregon State Library also has a clearinghouse that tracks challenges. And the there was a university in Missouri, their journalism um, yeah, the journalism department at the university, they also did some tracking of the challenges in Missouri. And when we compared all of those numbers, we found that three to eleven percent of challenges do not get reported to the American Library Association. Wait, I said that backwards, scratch that. Three to 11% do get reported. That's a very significant difference because if you do the math, if we received 347 challenges during 2018 and 97 of them were not reported, 97% of them were not reported, that's over 10,000 challenges that we don't know about. Kristen, could you also talk about a little bit about self-censorship? What it is, if it's happening, how it happens? So self-censorship um, can take a couple different forms and um, we see it a lot of times when either um, someone who has the authority to purchase materials or teach materials chooses not to because of a personal bias. So they may not um, agree with the content of the book and so therefore they won't purchase it. That's considered self-censorship. Um, another example would be if 
even though a person might agree with or like the material, they're worried that it would be controversial, that it would cause complaints to happen. Um, they think that it, uh, their administrator may not agree with having that service or that display or that material. Um, and so therefore, they would um, not purchase it for that reason. Um, and so both of those are considered self-censorship. And, you know, it's, it's very difficult because those are often one of the, the most um, kind of sneaky, insidious ways of censorship because they don't get reported um, and you don't always think about it as censorship. And it can often lead to kind of a snowballing effect that if you don't purchase one or you you don't teach one, then you won't teach any of them. Um, and so we we have some professional guidance that we talk about with teachers and with librarians about um, separating our professional responsibilities and our personal bias, um, personal values. And we talk about um, confronting censorship when we see it and and really speaking out and holding ourselves accountable to not doing something for fear of controversy, but doing something rather that will provide access and resources to the communities that need it and want it. Kristen, I'm also wondering if you um, or anyone who's who's joining us on this live stream um, have any experiences with censorship that have really stuck with you or that you would be willing to share? Um, let's see, experiences. Well, I did go through a censorship challenge when I was a young adult librarian um, at, in West Bend, Wisconsin. Um, and I showed you the picture earlier of the protest. There was um, a community member who wanted to have a online reader's advisory list removed from our website. And since we didn't really have policies and procedures in place for addressing that particular resource, there was a reconsideration form for over 80 books, um, LGBTQYA books, that um, they wanted removed from the library. And the whole issue of um, the challenge in our particular situation really snowballed from having wanting the books removed to labeling them as sexually explicit or moving them to the adult side. Again, all examples of censorship. Um, and it was about a six month product, pro, I'm sorry, six month um, challenge. And it really impacted our community. Um, it has stayed with me for the last 10 years. It um, was very traumatic. Um, librarians really go through a very personal trauma when they when they go through a challenge and it could be um, because they're attacked personally sometimes their safety is at risk they are often called names they are often doxxed on social media some of them may lose their jobs or or have um, professional repercussions it's it can be very difficult um, to go through something like this and it it you're attacked on multiple different fronts, you know, whether it's coming from an administrator, whether it's coming from the challenger, maybe your staff doesn't approve. It can all be very, um, very, very stressful. In my time at the American Library Association, I've had a number of conversations with librarians that have really stuck with me. Um, there were challenges, um, there was a challenge to a John Green novel in Kentucky at a school, um, at a high school. And the the way that the public librarians and the students uh, stood up and supported the teacher um, were really amazing. I, that was that was an incredible story. Um, let's see, there was, um, oh, there was a challenge that happened in, 
actually this is a band. This is a ballon, a band um, at a school, a middle school in New England in the Northeast that I can't remember what state it was. I want to say it was New Jersey or Rhode Island. And the, the librarian ended up losing her job. And there was one time when a librarian called me just in tears and she was so upset. Um, she really wanted to to defend the book and to provide access to it. Um, but she was told out and out that she would be fired um, if she didn't remove the book from the library and just didn't feel like she could make that choice. And, you know, it's, it's always a sad thing um, to see that happen. And it, it really broke my heart to see her feel so upset about it. But, you know, these are the decisions that we each and every one have to make. Um, it's never black and white. Censorship can be um, a very tricky thing. And it's, it's, a, it's a decision that we all have to make personally. When we, when we stand up or we speak out, we, draw, we put the light on things, it can be really, really hard. Um, we have another question. What should a library include in a challenge policy? Something that can help them be prepared for this, for these incidents? Oh, that's a great question. And I'm kind of a, um, a policy wonk and I, I love, I didn't realize when I started at the American Library Association that I would be reading so many policies, um, but I love it. And I've learned a lot about some of the good and the bad. Um, one thing, a couple things I would remember about policies is to make sure and review them. Obviously, every three to five years, I would say at least, just to make sure that um, it is really covering the materials and resources that your library provides. So one of the um, the resources that we're seeing challenges to are databases, and a number of challenge, um, sorry, uh, selection policies don't really include databases or any kind of online or electronic digital resource in their po in their policies and so they didn't consider it a challenge when there were parents that were complaining about um, pornography in the databases so um, to really make sure that your policies cover all the resources including services displays um, your website social media um, a lot of those issues as well the, I would encourage you to have policies for. Um, I think a really strong policy is always grounded in um, our core fundamental documents. So uh, each library that adopts um, or cites the American Library Association's Library Bill of Rights, I think those are really strong policies. Usually the board, um, the the key decision makers, the stakeholders, have read then the Library Bill of Rights and many of their interpretations. Um, and we find that then the stronger the decisions are stronger when you can base it on these fundamental documents like that. Um, the another thing about policies, see, I could go talk about policies forever, but this will be my last one, I promise. Um, is to have your policies reviewed by um, a local attorney, someone who can review it with an eye to um, state and federal law, um, making sure that it is meeting um, the, the legal and the organizational um, requirements. So, you know, that if you are writing a policy about meeting room use, that you are not discriminating on the basis of the content of the people using the, the meeting rooms. So just having an attorney look things over and making sure that it is um, all, you know, all your T's are crossed and your I's are dotted. Last one, I promise. <laughs> Thanks, Kristen, for giving um, some policy guidance. This next question comes from the Band Books Week Facebook page. Has ALA ever worked on a guide for critical thinking and reading as and to avoid challenges and censorship? A guide for critical thinking and reading. That's a really great idea. Um, 
and I know that there have been libraries who that have um, in response to censorship um, created forums and, and community discussions to, to do uh, increase critical thinking um, but the difficult part about preemptively trying to you know um, stop censorship before it happens is that you you just don't know it's really hard to target a resource like that if you don't know who your audience is going to be or what the book is going to what the resource is going to be that might be of concern or what their concern might be I mean we see challenges that are all over the place with regards to who initiated it so um, it could have been a parent, it could be a politician, it could be a school administrator, it could be a librarian. I mean, it's it's so broad, it would be hard to target, you know, to focus a, a toolkit or a resource to that. Um, that being said, there are some really great resources out there about, you know, talking about censorship and raising awareness of it and, um, advocating for the freedom to read, um, but just like to preemptively stop censorship before it happens, it would be hard to target it, but I think it's a great idea. I'd like to see more like it, yes. Kristen, can you talk a little bit about just the general benefits of having all of these array perspectives available on library shelves, why it's so important um, we have all of these um, opinions and perspectives in a place that where everyone is welcome. Oh, it's so important. Um, there are so many people in our world, and when you think, you know, I we so often live in our own little bubbles of what's going on in our social media feeds and in our professions and our workforce and our families that we don't see what's happening in countries all over the world or people in different states, different generations. Um, it's There's so many different perspectives to consider. So I think it's really important to have a lot of those different perspectives. And But the, also the viewpoints and the ideas. Um, one of the things that I often say is, um, I think reading something that I don't agree with makes it, makes me stronger in the beliefs that I do hold personally. Um, and so I'm a, a huge advocate for belief, for reading things um, that might make my skin crawl or um, that I really don't agree with. And talking about them helps me become a more critical thinker um, and and being aware of these issues that are out there. I, you know, I often see people wanting to challenge and censor materials because um, it's a detriment to society to have that viewpoint, that it's harmful to others to have racist content in materials or to have um, materials that advocate for violence. Um, and and I I disagree because I, I feel like when we have access to those materials and those thoughts, it helps us know how to best combat them so that we can think about and um, you know steer the conversation towards a, a better way of doing things sometimes. But you can't just take away that thought process. I really liked your point on reading um, different opinions or uh, opinions that are different from your own makes you stronger. Um, I thought that was very powerful. Um, and since it is Banned Books Week, um, the annual celebration of the freedom to read, I'm wondering if you could just go over some, some simple ways that readers can get involved with Banned Books Week and raising awareness about everything that was discussed today. Yes. So. Um, my one thing I always love to say, and I think this is because of my background as a librarian, um, if, if you can, thank your librarian, um, thank your teacher, someone who um, has a book that you really found powerful, they had to make that decision to put it out there for you. And um, sometimes you may not know it, but maybe they fought for that book. 
Um, and so having, you know, providing that access for you and they stood up for your right to read it and your right to access it and to think critically about it. Um, so thank them. Um, Cause that's one of the hardest things when you go through a challenge as a librarian, I think is that you hear so many of the negatives, you know, people call you names and everything like that. And you don't often hear, but thank you for providing the access to that. So, um, even if there's not a controversy, just go into your library and say like, hey, I really love that you have these books. And so thank you for providing them for you, for us and giving us access. Um, and, you know, to kind of instill that value in the next generation. So um, if you have kids or students in your life, uh, sharing with them the value of the right to read and what that means. Um, whether through education or just by reading banned books to them and making them aware of what their rights are, supporting them. You know, a lot of the times that we see challenges like this, they're happening in uh, schools and school libraries. And for every student whose First Amendment rights are violated, um, their parents have to be the ones that stand up um, and support them in their fight for their First Amendment rights and the freedom to read. So. Um, I just think about that that kind of generational shift as we move things um, to the next generation. I always think about the the Pico case, uh, Island Trees v. Pico, and Stephen Pico was in high school, and I I heard or I read one time in an interview that it was the public librarian um, at the time who who kind of hinted to him to guide him that he could sue the school district. Uh, for for violating his First Amendment rights, and I wonder what it would be like to be the first the public librarian who who gave that idea to Stephen Pico and the the ripple effect that it had, and how you know we are so much stronger today for him standing up and and speaking out against censorship. Um, so some of the other ways, you know, it, it could be the smallest things from you know putting up. Uh, putting bookmarks, putting um, Banned Books Week bookmarks in your books, um, in your library or in your little free library. I saw that the other day. I thought that was really great. Uh, there was a little free library outside someone's home and and I have a ton of these in my community and I love that. And so they had taken um, Banned Books Week bookmarks and put them in the books that went out that way. Or one guy had said that only Banned Books are in his little free library right now um, to celebrate Banned Books Week. Um, and it could be just you know, liking and sharing stuff on social media or, um, oh, writing a letter to your favorite band author. They go through so much when they're, um, they're their books are being censored. These are their words, their ideas, their viewpoints, their stories, their characters. Um, and they don't want to be censored any more than you want their stuff taken away from them. So uh, I think writing a letter and thinking, um, the band authors and celebrating their works and their rights um, is also another really great way to celebrate Band Books Week um, and just, uh, you know, kind of highlighting all that they do for us. Thanks, Kristen, for sharing those ways that everyone can celebrate Band Books Week. And maybe while we're wrapping up, um, whether you're joining us on Zoom or joining us on Facebook, if you want to post how you're celebrating Band Books Week. I love to see different ideas of people celebrating, whether it's um, a display in their library or even just, um, you know, reading a band book with their kid or going to a Band Books Week event. There are so many right now going on, whether it's, um, trivia and uh, there's there's lectures going on there's art exhibits going on for band books week there's drag queen story hours and um, movie uh, film festivals for band books week I mean it's just there are some really creative ideas out there and I just love it one of the um, programs that I've seen is um, a Harry Potter themed escape room mm. for Van Books Week. I thought that was so awesome. I would love to participate in that. Um, one um, attendee commented, we are having a reading of band materials around the world. Oh, that's a great idea. That sounds amazing. Yeah. I've seen some really great um, letters to the editor uh, and in local newspapers um, from just 
people who read and just celebrating Banned Books Week and encouraging their whole community to celebrate. That's been really great. And if you are hosting, planning, um, anything for Banned Books Week, please feel free to use the hashtag, hashtag Banned Books Week. That will let us see it, retweet it, amplify, ha amplify how you're celebrating Banned Books Week. Um, also feel free to tag us at OIF, or if you have any additional questions um, for Kristen, you can also tweet at her. Her handle is on the screen at kpeekle. Um, thank you so much for joining us today um, and for your support in celebrating Banned Books Week. Please feel free to share this video and any resources discussed today um, and have a happy thing, happy Banned Books Week. Thanks, Ellie. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kristen.